Hi, I'm Jessica. And I'm Sam. We're the Nutters, and we serve with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Papua New Guinea. So when I was 19, I had already worked in several uh, small engine, automotive, and, uh, and I also worked in a bus barn. I was helping with student ministry at the church, and I heard about uh, this organization that um, was a, a partner organization of Wycliffe. It's called JARS, and so I went down there, and that's when I first learned about um, Bible translation, and when I learned how many languages there are in the world, that a lot of these languages or minority languages, they don't have a Bible available to them at all. And I just really enjoyed that I could use my skill set working on fixing cars, um, volunteering in their shop there for missionaries while they were on furlough. So when I came back to back to normal work and in, in Texas where I was. I just kept thinking about that experience at JARS and I kept thinking, uh, I, I wanna do that with, with my career and with my life. I talked to a recruiter with Wycliffe. I gave him my grand plan of moving to North Carolina. And he said, are you willing to work anywhere? And I didn't wanna give the right answer or be a Jonah, so I just said, oh, I'm willing to work anywhere in the world for God. He said, well, there's this vision trip. Um, you go for three weeks with some um, college interns and you can go check it out. It was pretty nerve wracking to leave my job um, and leave my uh, you know, opportunities that I had in the States just for a mission trip. And God provided um, almost instantly all the money that I needed. It was there uh, through through the church I was going to at the time. And then when I got to Papua New Guinea, I got to see uh, I got to see the center, the mission center, where everyone on center uh, had also left their livelihood and their job and became missionaries. Being a part of bringing God's word to them and bringing more worshipers to God was the biggest reason for me to go to Papua New Guinea. So many of the, of the places, the only way to get there is helicopter. And then if they're fortunate to have an airstrip, well, those airstrips have to be maintained and they have to have to keep the grass down. So those airstrip mowers have to, have to work. There was a translator who, he had a four-wheeler that he used from his airstrip. Like the moment he landed in his village from his airstrip, he used it to get to his village, which was a little ways away and there's a river. And he had flipped the thing over in the river and it was all jacked up. And so this four-wheeler got flown back to us. And while I was there for those three weeks, I got to fix it and send it back to him. So like this four-wheeler was directly impacting Bible translation. This was this translator's tool to get from his airstrip to his village. And uh, that just, that made a big impact on me at the time was knowing that like I can use my skill set for Bible translation and, uh, and it has a direct impact. There's people out there that don't have access to God's Word. No relationship with God because they don't even have the Word of God. They, don't, they can't listen to God. I learned about all the other opportunities and the community there uh, and I thought I could see myself raising a family here. Um, one of my first like experiences, introductions to missions was when I was really, really little. We had one of those like leapfrog globes in our house and my mom was like helping me learn the different countries and she was like, this is Papua New Guinea and this is where our friends um, that go to church with us serve and work as missionaries. And I was like, what's a missionary? When I grow up, I'm gonna be a missionary. And like, I had no idea what I was saying. At some point in high school, um, we had a missionary come and speak to our youth group and she was telling a story um, about how she just moved overseas and works as a teacher and she uses that as a way to um, share God with the people over there. Um, and for the first time ever, I remember thinking like, oh, I, I could do that. Like maybe I'm supposed to do that. And so I remember praying on the way home, like, God, is this something that I'm just excited about? Or is this something that you're actually like putting on my heart? Um, and it wasn't like this answer from God, but I think that that was the beginning of slowly listening to um, 
to him through other people and to from experiences and little things that eventually was like, yes, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And um, I remember from that point on kind of knowing that I wanted to move overseas and I wanted to do some sort of ministry with children. And so from that point on in high school, I was going on mission trips anytime that they were coming available. I went to school to study ministry and missions and um, I began the pursuit um, of following God's call to like go overseas and do mis missions of some sort. So right off the bat, I got with a recruiter uh, and I asked him, uh, what does it take to join Wycliffe full time uh, so that I can go back to Papua New Guinea as a missionary? And so I left that job uh, at, at a small engine shop that I was at and I went full time with Wycliffe, um, raising the funds and, and the, the monthly partnerships to go back. And I started selling everything that I owned. Um, I was selling this foosball table that had no legs. And this random guy on Craigslist comes up, buys it, says he's buying it for his small group. And I said, small group like Jesus? And he said, yes, small group like Jesus. And he invited me to his small group. And I shared uh, about Papua New Guinea and how I needed to build a team of partners. And you know what? That was my first financial partner, was this random guy I had never met in my life. Not my grandma or some church friends that taught me Sunday school. It was this random guy. And that was just God showing me, look, Sam, this isn't you, this is me. This is God providing. I was getting my undergrad, and um, any time that there was a trip that was a for like that I could manage, or I felt like I was being called to, um, I would go just to see if like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this where I'm supposed to be going? I was just trying to get like all the feelers out and listen to what um, God was saying. Of like, I was waiting for to know like where I was supposed to go. Um, so I was kind of in this waiting phase and just doing my best to like equip myself. Um, and at some point during one of these missions classes, um, a recruiter from Wycliffe came in and they were sharing about Bible translation. It reminded me of um, a boy I met in high school and um, that my mom had told me Sam Nutter had moved overseas or was getting ready to work with Wycliffe. And so I was like, oh, maybe I should message Sam and ask him about Wycliffe and what he's doing and how, like, what's going on. But I didn't want to text him because I didn't want him to get the wrong idea. <laughs> like, I wasn't interested in like any kind of relationship. I just w wanted to know about what he was doing with Wycliffe. I don't often like hear things from God, but I felt very clearly God was saying like, I want you to leave the door open on relationships. Like, I know you want to like say, hey, I don't need this right now in my life, but God was clearly asking me to keep the door on relationships open. And I was like, okay, sure. Like, I don't have any idea what that means. And it was the next day that Sam emailed me back and said, hey, um, I'm interested in you. I've had a crush on you for years. Um, what do you say? <laughs> and so that's kind of the context behind my response to his email, which was, um, I'm keeping the door open. I'm interested in like growing a friendship, relationship, getting to know one another, but I'm not really wanting to jump into a relationship, but at the same time, like, you kind of see where I'm coming from here, where I was like, I don't know what to say. I want to leave the door open and honor what God asked me to do. But at the same time, I'm like afraid of stepping into this. So I get this email back from Jessica after my newsletter, and I'm thinking, wow, okay, I need to respond. I need to do something about this. I need to let her know about, um, I'm just going to spill the beans and tell her that I like her. Uh, that I have for a long time and uh, and maybe we can get to know each other. There's not a lot of guys that you me that are like, yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to move overseas. I'm wanting to leave what I have here in the States and move overseas. And so it wasn't really something that I like thought that was going to come so easy. And so to hear that he was already overseas doing what I already wanted to do was this huge benefit. But at the same time, I didn't want it was very important to me that I wasn't just moving to a place overseas because of a boy that I liked. And so I was doing a lot of praying and asking God to like make it very clear if this is where I was supposed to go and at the same time if this was the relationship that I was supposed to be pursuing. There was a point when I I called her mom who I did student ministry with at her church before and I, I just said, hey, like um, I'd like to start 
a exclusive relationship with your daughter with the short-term goal of marriage and the long-term goal of glorifying God. He came back um, one fall, proposed, um, we got engaged and then he left a month later. After this month together, he left, um, went back overseas and then I visited him over spring break. And that was my first like insight into Papua New Guinea. That was my first time there. And I remember really clearly thinking, this place feels like all of my favorite parts of all the places I've been, like mixed into one place. It was really an answer to prayer and confirmation that this was the right direction for us. We came back together from that spring break trip, and it was amazing because no more long distance. Like, that was a huge deal for us. Um, and so I kind of finished um, school strong. He was doing partnership development. Um, we got married, and then about a year after the week of our first anniversary, we landed on the field for the, my first time, full time. And right, and my third time back as a career missionary. For me, uh, it's been a lot of um, realizing that it's shifted from Sam on missions to our family, the Nutter family on mission for God. This time back in the States for the first time, I think, was my first wrestling with that question of, it's not obviously, yes, um, I'm asking you to go back, but I feel like at the end of this past year that we've been here, we are finally feeling like, okay, yes, this is the next step. This is where we're supposed to be going but we just needed to get a little bit more healthy first and be, our goal is sustainability. Like when we go there, we wanna be there long-term and when we wanna um, be our best self so that we can glorify God more fully. And if we're not healthy individuals, we're not gonna last in a more isolated um, environment, more rugged living. Like if you're not healthy, you're not gonna be sustainable because we could be doing ministry all day long, but if our, the ministry of our family isn't, healthy, then we're not going to be glorifying Him as much as right. we could be. And I think at the end of the day, no matter what my hands are doing, whether um, in the States or overseas, it's the relationships that are pulling us back to Papua New Guinea and those relationships that um, God is building and growing through doing life together is mm -hmm. what keeps me going back. You know, in the same way that we ask people to support the work that we're doing, well, we're supporting the work that Bible translators are doing. Mm -hmm and Bible translators are supporting maybe the pastors who need a Bible to read, and the church, and the congregation, and it, it go, in, in PNG you say ego, 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 it means it keeps on going, the next one and the next one. <laughs> when we first left, we were starting our life together, married for the first time. So we left living with other people, freshly married, and we moved into our own house for the first time. So. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes as we were prepping to go, people were like, wow, what a sacrifice you guys are making. You guys are doing this, like, what martyrs for the Lord. <laughs> and we're like, we're like young, starting for the first time. Like, this feels like an adventure. This doesn't necessarily feel like we're losing much. Um, but I feel like now with two kids under the age of three, going back, leaving our families, leaving their grandparents, leaving community, um, that we've built here, like for the first time, um, I at least am really understanding the weight of that sacrifice. And um, it hits a little different now with a family. We from Wycliffe are given a budget to raise and that budget pays for our salary and insurance, everything. Um, and so we all we ask of individuals interested in our ministry is that they pray and ask God ask God what God wants you to do and answer that call. You can do it, you can go. Like it doesn't take any special degree or special um, or ordination or any kind of gift in evangelism. Like you can use the skills that you have to serve. And so if you're feeling like um, God is putting that on your heart, like reach out to us, reach out to your church, any way that you can go on a short-term trip or look into ways to move overseas, like do it. <laughs>